Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to you. Welcome to my lecture on how to create a use case specification. So um, this is the lecture that's coming after the lecture on how to create uh, use case uh, diagrams and how to work with use cases. And I'm going to continue on with the same example that we were using in that uh, lecture. So uh, just to refresh your memory, in the last uh, unit, we created a use case diagram for a student attendance reporting uh, system. And there were use cases that were primarily for the student, and we packaged them up and called them student-facing use uh, cases log attendance and generate student attendance report. There was another package that had use cases primarily for the benefit of the instructor, uh, set up new class, add change, delete student registration, generate instructor attendance report. And then we had uh, two administrative use cases um, used by uh, a number of kinds of users when they're playing the role of either system user or, for a very few people, system administrator. And they were authorized user and login. Okay, so um, what do you get to know from a use case uh, diagram? Well, it turns out not very much. Okay, you get a big picture view of the system you do get enough information to really understand the scope of the system and to identify the parts of the system that you, as an interested party, would want to uh, uh, focus on. So, for instance, if you were one of the stakeholders working with a systems analyst and you were responsible to see that the uh, functionality for the student was uh, going to work as planned, um, you could look at this um, page that I have up right now and see, okay, were well, there are two primary business-oriented use cases for the student, log attendance and generate student attendance report. That sounds about right. Log attendance, I wonder how that works. Well, how do you find out how that works? Well, if you want to know anything more, you have to go to the use case specification for log attendance. So that's where we're going now. We're going to learn about use case specifications. Okay, so uh, let's let's look at a um, sorry. Here's where we're going to go next. L let's look at a uh, template file that I'm uh, providing to students for creating use case specifications. And let's uh, kind of talk through the template. And then uh, what I'm going to do following that is I'm going to give you a brief introduction to the use case specification for that log attendance use case. I'm not going to overly burden it because my tutorial on how to create a use case uh, specification has me um, creating that one. So I want to make sure that I don't cover things uh, too many times on uh, the exact same subject. So here we're going to go through the, the template file. So I have taken a template file uh, that was originally authored by IBM. Uh, IBM has been a big uh, player in the use of um, all things related to object-oriented analysis and design. And um, object-oriented analysis and design uh, is really the... Uh, one of the dominant uh, methodologies in use uh, today. Um, and uh, it, it, is, it makes use of 
a number of uh, standard uh, diagrams that are expressed in the UML. And the use case diagram that we learned is part of the UML. Now, the, uh, the UML is silent on what a use case specification might be like. So um, different uh, practitioners have uh, gone ahead and uh, said, well, here's the information that should be in a use case spec. There's a lot of agreement among the practitioners and the authors. Uh, there's a lot of authors in this field. I've got at least 10 books on how to write a good use case uh, specification. So, um, and I don't have all of them. So they're probably closer to 20 um, decent books on this. And as you would imagine, they all agree about some parts and, you know, they deviate from each other on other parts. And so the general practice is for a particular uh, group of people who are practicing uh, together uh, people at one company forever or a development group within a large company, they tend to come up with a, a standard set of rules for what's going to be in their use case uh, specification. And IBM, who's been selling a lot of tools to these people, have, um, have a template. And what typically happens, uh, you know, they recommend that each of the each of, uh, of their clients um, uh, personalize the template, customize the template to make it most relevant for their circumstances. Now, this is a template that I think, I forget where this came on. It may have come from the Iowa Department of Transportation or something like that. But this was uh, customized from the basic IBM one. And then I customized it further. Uh, I like what we have here. It's not exactly the same as what everybody uses. It's a different from what's shown in our uh, textbook, the Hopper textbook in um, Appendix uh, 7A talks about a written use case, and they're talking about the same thing as here. And they have uh, they have a lot of what we have. They certainly have the same spirit of what we have, but they have some things that are different. So uh, here's what I'm going to want you to be doing. So um, on the title page, we have uh, uh, the name of our course, just to kind of uh, personalize it for us. Uh, we have a placeholder for the name of the system. OK, so in this case, it might be uh, uh, attendance reporting system. Um, we have the name of the use case. OK, this is the same name that appears on the use case uh, d diagram in case of the one that we're going to work with over the course of, of the next couple of videos. The one that we're going to work with is log attendance. And if you remember, that's part of the use cases for the student. OK, and so when we write this down, we use the exact same name. These things are supposed to agree perfectly. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to have versions of our use case uh, specification and to be able to do version control on it. Um, page two of our form is mostly metadata. OK. Um, when I do the tutorial, you will notice that, well, first of all, I want to say that this uh, thing that we're looking at here is a PDF. It was uh, generated from a Microsoft Word uh, docx file. I'd be showing it to you in, in the Word application, but uh, the virtual machine that I'm uh, doing this lecture on doesn't have Word installed, so I created a PDF so we could look at what the template file looks like. Uh, but when I do my tutorial, I will actually be using Word, and you'll be able to see how to use the features 
in order to use this uh, particular uh, template file. This uh, top box of metadata information is a header. Uh, and so to get at these fields, you need to do, uh, you need to go and uh, select the header and edit it. Okay, so we've got the name of the class. Uh, we want to enter the name of the use case. We want to enter the version. We want to enter the date. Uh, we probably want a, a more recent uh, date than 2015, blah, blah, blah. You put the right one in there. And then we have, this is uh, kind of typical on these kinds of documents. We have a revision history log. So every time we revise this, we add a line. And of course, if we ran out of rows in, in the table, we would use the word feature to add more rows to the table so you could see what the revision history is. What's been done to the document and who did it and when. Okay, so now we're getting down into the specification proper. And I just want to note that on all the rest of these pages, the text that was at the very top of the last page repeats, and it repeats because it's a header. So it's on this page, it's on the next page. Well, that's it. That's all the pages that we have, okay? And that's why it repeats, because it's a header. Okay. Um, so let me make this type a little bigger. Okay. All right. So... I would say this is a good template. Is it perfect? No, it's not. Okay? So there may be an annoying thing here or there. Now, one of the things I find annoying about the template is that there are several places where you have to enter the same information in different spots. Now, what I don't like about that is that you have the possibility of that information should change you have to remember to change it and in this case I think it's three places so the use case name appears on the cover page okay no it's four places I can see here on the cover page in the header in this heading and down here under one they should all say the same thing so once I get those done they're gonna say log attendance Okay, so what if I decided to change the name to record attendance? Okay, well, I'd have to go back and change it in four, four places. Is this great design for a form? No, I think it's a little wanting. Okay, I would like it to be, we put it into one place and poof, it appears everywhere else, kind of magically. Um, but that's just not the way they design the form. Okay. So when you have filled that in, you, uh, we know what is the name of the use case that this is for. And again, this has to be one of the use cases that's on the diagram. If you go to write the specification and you go, oh man, you know, that diagram's all wrong, okay? I think that the use case is properly whatever. Um, Fine, use that name here, but only if and only if you go back and change the use case diagram to agree with it word for word, okay? Because this is like an explosion of what's inside that ellipse on the use case diagram. Okay, the next thing you have to know about our template here is that we have quite a bit of text that is shown in uh, blue type and italics and uh, for the most part they're inside of square brackets although some of the square brackets are not totally intact that's probably uh, my fault um, these are directions for filling out the form so as you fill out the form you should get rid of these uh, blue italic in brackets uh, uh, paragraphs right so when we're done all the blue should go away we're not putting our type our type is going to go in as plain old black Roman type 
okay? These are directions. Okay, so we know how to do the use case name. Brief description. Okay, the description should briefly convey the role and purpose of the use case. A single paragraph should suffice for this description. In my mind, a good sentence should suffice. Why? Well, it goes back to the issue of maintainability. One of the things I don't like about having the use case name in four places on the document is if you come up with a better name, which you might, uh, you have to go change it on four play in four places. Likewise, if you're too detailed in the brief uh, description, you you pick up details that are better expressed later in the document. Okay. And what I would like, I think that a great brief uh, description is one that uh, doesn't have to change. You can change the flow of e events. You can change the details of how we're going to do the use case. And as long as you don't change what we're trying to achieve, the brief description is not going to have to change. So for me, the briefer, the better. It's got to be longer than the use case name. So for me, um, a good sentence, a good sentence, maybe a compound sentence, at most say two sentences, but not a uh, five sentence paragraph. And if you have a five sentence paragraph under brief uh, description, you've probably included too many of the details from later in the document. And the problem there is, should they change, you're going to have to go maintain your brief description. If you forget to do it, then you're left with a misleading brief description. Not a good idea. Now we come to the main part of the um, use case specification, and that is flow of events. Okay. Use cases are notable for um, it, it, describing what happens during the use case in these narratives. So they're in uh, prose, okay, kind of structured prose. You'll see it's kind of brief. Um, it's, not, um, it's not as uh, flowery and flowing as the prose that you would expect in a novel. Um, maybe even not so fully decorated as the prose you would see in a uh, nonfiction book, but uh, maybe closer to something that you would see in a user manual, okay? So um, uh, these narratives are hooked into this outline structure here. The main one is called the basic flow so it's a flow, a narrative flow. It's the flow of events, how things, how the action flows during the use case. So we have a basic flow, then we have alternative uh, flows. And now the basic flow is really uh, genius, okay? Historically, when we've tried to write specifications, uh, we've been left to a couple of approaches. Uh, one uh, is that we tried to do it in regular old narrative uh, prose. And we tried to describe everything in a single narrative. Okay, well, that turned out to have a lot of ambiguity in it. So it, different people would read uh, different things. So we, uh, came back from that and for a long time uh, when we were doing uh, data flow diagramming as the uh, general way that we wrote specifications for the requirements we used this approach called structured English that was very much like uh, pseudocode okay and it had a lot of if else begin end, all kinds of things that you would see in code um, we had two problems with that approach. Uh, problem one 
was that because of the if, else, begin, end uh, kind of stuff, uh, it was very programmery, and the users who we tried to review this with um, got put off by it, okay? Number two, we tried to explain the normal case and the abnormal case at the same time. So here's the genius of this approach. We separate the normal case from the abnormal case. So the basic flow um, describes what happens in the normal case when everything goes well. Now this is called a lot of things. It's called the basic flow. It's called the happy day scenario. It's called, a, I mean, there are 10 uh, names for it, some of them uh, more clever than the next. But the genius of this is that in the basic flow, you describe everything going normal and right, okay? So that the user, as they read through the narrative with you, they're not uh, distracted by, well, what if this? Well, what if that? Well, what if this? We handle that in alternative flows, okay? So that the basic flow is going to read like a children's book. And, and it's really nice. Now, the basic flow always begins, in fact, all the flows, they always uh, say how they begin, and they always say how they end. So when we look at the, the example of um, this uh, specification, we'll see that these things say how they begin and how they end. And in between, their uh, narrative uh, prose, a little techy looking. Um, so in fact, this would be a good time for us to just go over and look at what we did for log attendance. Okay, I think I'll, I'll go back and forth between these. So you can see, I filled this in, uh, use case name, log attendance. Um, I filled in all this metadata, including the metadata that's in the, the header. And here, we're gonna have to get a little bigger. All right. Um, one bigger. There we go. So log attendance is a use case name. I know we have that in too many places, but that's just the way the template works. The brief uh, description is uh, quite brief. The flow of e events begins with the basic flow. And here's the way this particular one r reads. The use case begins when student signals that he, she, he wishes to log attendance. So use cases always begin with some actor interacting with the system, okay? Now, and when I say, it, yes, so that begins a use case. It also begins uh, the narrative in the basic flow, okay? And then we say, System it displays a list of classes in which the student is registered. Student selects a class for which she, he wishes to log attendance. System requests the class meeting password. Student enters the class meeting password. System confirms that the student has successfully logged attendance. The use case ends. So this is a really... Uh, if I do say so, say so myself, this is a really good uh, flow. Uh, what do I like about this? Well, first, it says explicitly how it begins. And it's always an actor uh, interacting with the system. Okay? Use cases always begin with actors. Now, um, Sometimes it, people might say, well, in modern systems, that's true, but we do have some things that happen on a timed uh, uh, basis. Like we have things that run like once a day or they run once a quarter. Well, what people do in use cases is that they actually have a fictional actor called either the clock or the calendar 
okay, and that clock or the calendars signals that they want to begin the process. So um, for things that are timed, uh, we have a fictional actor, okay? So because of that, um, it always begins with action from some actor, okay? Um, then here's how the flow usually goes. It goes like a tennis match. Actor does something, system does something. Actor does something, system does something. Actor does something, system does something, the use case ends. Okay? It's like a tennis match, back and forth and back and forth. Why? Because we're describing interaction between actors and systems, and that's how those things go. Right? Could the system do several things in a row? Yeah, it could. Okay? If we wanted to take the system activity and be more detailed about it, we might say that, you know, the system does three things in a row uh, and then the actor gets involved again. Could the actor do two things in a row? Yeah, they could. All right. But for the most part, it's actor system, actor system. Now, if you recall the use case diagram, this is a use case with a single actor. If there was more than one actor, it might be, um, you know, it could be actor one does uh, something, system does uh, something. Actor two does something, system does something. Actor two does something, system does something. Actor one does something, sister do, system does uh, something, the use case ends. So it can alternate between actors, okay? That's just fine. But the general pattern that we're going to see is going to be a tennis uh, match, okay? If you have that kind of, if you have that kind of rhythm to your flows, you're getting the idea, okay? And so we've got that rhythm to the flows. The actors are mentioned. The system is uh, mentioned in alternation. Okay, we always say which actor starts it by interacting with the system, and we always say the use case ends. Okay, so what corresponds to this on the use case diagram? Let's go back and look, because uh, I get students who get caught on this quite a bit. Well, on the diagram, we have the actor. Okay, so if you read through a use case specification and it's talking about actors they had better appear as interacting with the use case on the use case uh, diagram now can you get in, into writing the the specification and realize oh I don't have enough actors sure you can that's the way this kind of work um, happens so how do you deal with that well you put them into the specification, but you go back and you change the diagram and add another actor, right? So the name of the, of the use case for the specification is the same as the name here on the diagram. The actors that, uh, that are talked about in the specification are the same ones that are on the diagram, okay? If they're talked about in the, in the specification and they're not on the diagram, that's an error. If they're shown on the diagram and not talked about in the specification, that's an error. They're supposed to match up exactly. Okay, let's go back to our spec. All right, and we always say how the use case ends. Now, normally, before the use case ends, Okay, typically we have the system sending out some kind of a response to the actor. And then the actors collectively are kind of on their own until they want to interact with the system again, in which case they crank up a use case. And how does that begin? Well, it begins with an actor 
signaling the system that they want to get started again, right? So normally you can imagine the system is just waiting. So the system uh, just waits uh, for the actor to get ready to use it again. And that's what systems do. Okay, now we talk about system here, right? Where's the system on the use case diagram? The system on the use case diagram is the sum of the use case symbols. So when we say that the system does something, we're talking about the, uh, the functionality that's inside log attendance. Okay, I see people want to say, oh, let's put the system out here as an actor. Well, we can have systems who are actors. They're other systems. They're not ours. They're external systems. They're systems that use our system. Our system is not an actor on our use case diagram ever. Okay, um, our system lives in our use case uh, diagram it lives in the collection of all the use cases that are in the diagram okay so everything that is uh, collectively inside of the boundary boxes that's the system okay so don't represent our system as an actor on our use case uh, diagram or um well, you've made a mistake. Okay, so that's the basic flow. Uh, okay, remember the basic flow is always going to be telling us um, about um, what the normal case is. This was really, I think, genius because um, programmers, programmer developer kinds of people, have to think about not only what's happening in the normal case or the happy day scenario, they have to think about all the alternatives and they have to think about where to test for them, right? They're, they're in a very detail-oriented uh, business, okay? Um, the problem is that historically when we were trying to explain it all to the user together, the way it would probably appear in a computer program we lost their attention. So now what we've done is we have separated the normal case from the unusual cases or, or the less frequent uh, cases. And that's the genius of how they designed these specifications. So after the basic flow, we get into alternative ones. And let's just look at the template here. Um, so uh, here we're showing uh, two alternative flows. We're also showing that you could have a subflow within an alternative flow. So we have a first alternative flow and an alternative subflow. Um, and you can see that we numbered these. So you can see that the alternative subflow goes uh, with the first alternative flow. And um, what we're saying is that something's going to happen that's going to interrupt the flow of activity in the basic flow. Okay, so um, what we're saying, here's all the things that can go differently. And typically the way these alternative flows work is they explain where in the basic flow they can take uh, control. Like what can happen such that this alternative flow is started. And then they'll say, again, um, they'll have the same kind of uh, tennis match uh, kind of um, structure. Uh, actor does, system does, actor does, system does, actor does, system does. Then at the very end, we really have to say how we're going to end. And here it's even more imp important than in the basic flow because we have to decide, are we going to rejoin the basic flow where we left it? That's a typical thing. Are we going to rejoin the basic flow somewhere else? 
that's maybe a little sloppy, but it can be done. Or is the use case going to end? Okay, so let's look at some alternative flows here. Okay. Okay, so the first one, student cancels logging. So I say at any time during the use case prior to student entering the class meeting password, student may signal the system that she, he wishes to cancel this logging. So that's how we get started. What do we do? Well, we don't do anything. This stops the use case. So we say the use case ends. Okay, so that's how you cancel it. All right, what about the part where the student's not registered for any classes? So they start the basic flow. They go, you're not registered for any classes. I know who you are, but you're not registered for any classes. Okay, so the flow begins when student signals that she, he wishes to log attendance and there are no registrations for student in the attendance system. System displays an error message, the use case ends. Okay, so I'm not going to go through all of these because um, I'm going to go through, I think, all of them when I do the tutorial. Uh, okay, so um, the, what you can think of is between the basic flow, which is, which is the standard way that things go, everything's going well or normal, and these alternatives, okay, um, we describe everything that can go on in the use case. And the combination of these could be pretty um, complex. For instance, it's entirely possible we'd start in the basic flow, we'd interrupt and do alternative three, we'd rejoin the basic flow, then we'd interrupt and do alternative six, we'd rejoin the basic flow, we would finish the basic flow, and the use case would end. That's entirely possible. So because of the way that we're expressing this in terms of the basic flow and these alternatives, and because of the way that, ways that they can interact with each other, you can really describe some pretty complex uh, um, system uh, actor interaction behavior. Okay, what comes after alternative flows? Well, special requirements. Now, special requirements, this is a section that, that is in all these IBM outlines. Does everybody have this section? Uh, no. Okay. Um, special requirements are non-functional requirements. Now, we haven't covered them in our class yet, okay? Um, what's a non-functional requirement? Um, well, I, I don't, I don't want to give away that unit too soon, but it's things like uh, uh, performance, reliability, security, um, any of those kinds of things which are not typically uh, behavior that the system has to exhibit, but the quality of that behavior. Okay, now, in our approach to doing systems analysis, we're going to have a special section of our report called non-functional requirements. Would it be okay to not express any here in the use case specification and express them all in the special section? Yes. Okay. This is just a place where we can highlight the non-functional requirements that are important to this use case. All right. And you'll see how we express them when we do that um, um, in the tutorial. What's next? Preconditions. So uh, a precondition of a use case is the state of the system that must be present prior to a use case being performed. So preconditions are very important to the spirit of how we use use cases, right? 
So let's go back and look at our use case a diagram and you'll get the spirit of this. Okay, so log attendance and generate student attendance report are, are the two use cases that a student can do. Now, can anybody do that? No, the system has to know that they, they are, um, they are authorized to use the system and in particular to use the system in a student role. How does the system find that out? Well, the student has already run successfully the login use case. So when they did that, they played the role of system user and they logged in. When they logged in, the system says, oh, what's this user authorized for? How does the system know that? Well, previously a system admin had authorized the user to play the role of student. So in the use case specification for log attendance, the login use case is a precondition, okay? That means the student cannot run log attendance if they haven't logged in. They also, even if they've logged in, they could maybe run log attendance or they could run generate student attendance report, but could they run these use cases that are for the instructor? No, they couldn't because with the authorization that they've received by virtue of their login, they're not allowed to act as an instructor. So how does this usually manifest itself in the user interface? Well, there were times when we would give uh, menus of all system functions and um, if somebody uh, chose the menu item, uh, that they were allowed to do, then we'd get the behavior that we wanted from the system. If they chose a menu item that they were not allowed to do, you would get some kind of a complaint. Eh, you're not allowed to do that. The modern approach is we only show people things that they're allowed to do. Okay, so in our system, if a particular user has not logged in, what are they going to see that they can do? Well, they're going to see that they can run login. That's all that gets exposed to them. Now, let's say they log in and they've been authorized to act as a student. What are they going to see? Well, they're only going to see um, log attendance and generate student attendance report. Okay. So, and then how do we show that in our... Um, in our, our use case specification. Well, let's go look. Okay, in um, preconditions, we say one of the preconditions is log in. Okay, Be before starting this use case, student must have successfully completed the login use case, resulting in permission being granted for the role of student. Perfect. All right. Now, uh, this is a way that these two use cases can have some interaction with each other without us having to draw lines on the diagram. You'll remember that we had these uh, um, uh, when we were learning how to draw the diagrams, uh, we were, um, we had includes and extends uh, relationships. And I said, eh, as a beginner, you want to stay away from that. Because we can, we can say that a, um, that a login, a login use case is a precondition for log attendance. Um, that, so we don't have to show that relationship on the diagram itself, okay? And the other part of why we don't have to do those relationships are these uh, uh, alternative uh, uh, flows. So something being included in something else, 
Well, that's uh, taken care of by um, uh, it being a precondition. Okay, something being something extending uh, something else. Well, that something can be expressed as an alternative flow. So, yeah, I took a couple of things off the table in terms of drawing the diagrams, but we still can cover those uh, cases very, very well by doing a good job on alternative flows and on preconditions. Okay? Okay, let's go to the next part. The next part is post conditions. Okay? And uh, so the, the post uh, conditions is a list of possible states the system can be in immediately after a use case has finished. Uh, okay, so um, you'll remember that these uh, systems that we have typically have to keep track of their state. And they typically do this, they persist their state typically in some kind of a database. Okay, so the, the uh, question is, at the end of the use case, what state is a database in? Okay. Um, and usually, you can think of the state of the system or the database after um, the use case. Uh, usually, it's in one of two conditions. Either this use case uh, succeeded, in which case uh, the work has all been done and things have been changed in the database, or it failed, okay, um, in which case, probably nothing has been done, or to the extent anything was done, we backed it out. So let's go look at that in a real use case specification. So what I usually do is I usually have uh, uh, post conditions. I usually have a successful one and an unsuccessful one. Okay, this is kind of my style. And there are a lot of people who do this. I, I find it very helpful. So uh, the successful is going to is going to be when we successfully complete uh, uh, typically the the basic flow, and the unsuccessful is going to be typically when we go to an alternate flow and we get bounced out. At the end of the alternate flow, we say uh, use case ends. So in a successful post condition. System has logged student attendance for the proper class meaning in the database. So we change the database. Unsuccessful. No changes have been made to the state of the database. That makes sense, right? Now the next, um, the next uh, part of our. Uh, a template I'm going to ask you to not use. This extension points is for these include and extends relation point uh, uh, relationships and these are more for I would say advanced users of the use case approach and we're not going to recommend that you do it. So instead of having these extension points where we say that things are um, where things are uh, extended, right? Um, instead of having includes and extends, we're not going to do that. So if you include extension points, uh, you can just say no extension points expected. Either that or, or just leave that out of the outline altogether. I should probably pull it out of the template, but I haven't done that yet. Okay, so here if we go over to my example one, uh, I, d I don't have it. <laughs> I got rid of it. Okay, so you're not e you don't even see it listed and then have me say uh, no extension points expected. No, I, I just hit the delete button on that part of the outline and it's gone. Okay, that brings us to key scenarios. Okay, and key scenarios is our last part. Key scenarios uh, explains the following thing, okay? 
uh, I said that every time that we go through the use case, we're going to start in the basic flow, and then we may jump off into an alternate flow, and then we may jump back into the basic, and then we might f finish the basic. Another scenario would be we start in the basic, oh, and we go all the way through. That's, that's you know, the basic uh, case. Um, we may start in the basic, we go into an alternate, and we end right there because we're in some kind of air condition. So this combination of the basic flow and alternates and how they happen, each of these is called a scenario. Okay? It's some combination of the basic flows and alternate flows. And you can imagine if you have a basic flow and say six alternate flows, you could cook up a lot of different uh, uh, scenarios. Now, do you need to describe every one? No, you don't. The key scenarios gives you the opportunity to identify ones that you in particular want to review with the stakeholders when you're going over this uh, specification. All right? So um, we give... Uh, a key scenario name, give a brief description of the path through the flows the scenario takes. If you have illustrated the activity with the scenario with an activity diagram, then refer the readers to the activity diagram. Okay, so activity diagramming is another way to express the logic of a use case. We haven't learned that yet. That's going to be in our next unit. Okay, so at that point, when we learn how to do that, then if we chose to provide an activity diagram for this particular scenario, we will, um, we will point to it uh, here. Okay, now there's another issue here, and that is you don't want to, this is a lot like that brief uh, description we had up front, we don't want to give too much of the play-by-play -play here. We just want to say, the scenario we're talking about is the one where we start here, we go there, we come back here, we go there, we come back here, we end. Okay? And then how does all that happen? Look at the details up, up, up above. You don't want to express those details twice because if they change, you don't want to maintain them in two places. So let's look at the example. Okay, so here the only one that we have um, identified is the basic scenario. This is the one where we do the basic flow. Student logs attendance at a class meeting using the basic flow. Okay, what other ones could I have identified? Um, oh, let's say... We think the users are pretty concerned about and, and don't quite understand what's going to happen if they're not registered for any classes. So we might say they begin in the basic flow and then they, um, uh, uh, they execute the flow, student not registered for any classes, and then the use case ends. Okay, so we, when we're describing a scenario, it's essentially basic flow, alternative, return to basic flow, alternative, return to basic flow, end. Or basic flow all by itself. That's what we just showed. So it's what combination of these flows makes up a scenario that we want to call attention to and um, when we review the document with our uh, stakeholders. And that's it. So where do we go to from here? Well, this is going to hold most of the information that people are going to want to know about how the use case actually works. Um, in the next unit, we're going to talk about two documents that we can create that will give more detail or detail expressed another way about the logic. 
One is we can take a, a key scenario and illustrate it with an activity diagram, which is a, a newfangled flowchart. Um, and the other thing that we're going to learn how to do is how to take some of the logic that we might be referring to in here and express it as uh, a decision table. And this is a really old school kind of way to express uh, programming logic that is still pretty, pretty powerful stuff. And uh, I'm going to want you to be able to uh, do. So these would be two things which give more detail uh, than the specification itself. Those would be in the next unit. But we're not going to worry about them yet. Um, you're ready to uh, go off and create your own specification. In the uh, tutorial, I do this. I create this. Uh, spec that we see here on the fly so uh, and I talk about some other considerations that I haven't talked about in the lecture so I invite you to uh, view the tutorial and see that there and I'm going to say bye until next time bye bye <laughs>